If you would, be turning to 1 Samuel 2. 1 Samuel 2. Very familiar. 1 Samuel 2. And I didn't mark it, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find it. So you all might have to help me. 1 Samuel. Okay. <laughs> there we go. 1 Samuel chapter 2. <laughs> I will get there in a minute. Bear with me. I can't, my hands are so dry, I cannot hardly turn pages, so. <clears throat> All right, 1 Samuel chapter 2. <clears throat> now, before I read that, I, this is where I'm going to be. I mean, you don't have to worry about turning anywhere else, but this is where I'm going to be, but before I go into reading that, I wanted to say a few things first. My title this morning is, Who is God? It's a good question, but it does matter how you ask this question. I mean the attitude in which you ask this question. There are two places that I know of in Scripture where this kind of question has been asked before. Exodus 5.2, and Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. You can see the pride in Pharaoh when he asked this question. He was not lying because he did not know who the Lord is. But he was wrong about letting Israel go. There are many who ask this kind of question and with this attitude today. Some who say they do not believe in God at all, and also some who say they worship God, but they do not know Him. These might not ask a question per se, but they say it like this when they are told of the God in Scripture. My God is not like that. Truer words could not be spoken of those who know not Him. But when we have another passage where one we have another passage where one does ask this question, and listen, listen to that one, Acts nine verses three through five. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou, persecutest thou me? And he said. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, and it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Notice the different placement of this one asking the question as opposed to the other one we just mentioned. Here is one asking the question in the dirt. He was put in the dirt by our Lord. This is one who was in the act of persecuting our Lord. This he was doing by way of persecuting the church of God and wasting it, as it says in another place. But he asked Saul, Why persecutest thou me? And then Saul asked, Who art thou, Lord? Here is one who has been abased and is not asking the question in pride, but truly asking so that he might know the one who has accosted him in such a way. So let's look at who God is just a minute before I get to my text. I just want to lay this groundwork before we go to our text. We have passages that describe to us who God is. He, Hebrews 12, 28 through 29, just for a few verses here. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So I gather from this that God is one who will consume all those who do not reverence him and fear him. This is not a question here, it's a statement. God is a consuming fire. 
Here's another one, Romans 12, verses 16 through 19. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. This is who God is, the one who is a consuming fire. He will take vengeance on those who do not bow down to him. Those who don't want a God like this to reign over them, just like I did at one time. He will take vengeance on all his enemies. This is who God is. But then we also read passages like the following. Hebrews 2.17 Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. We read here of a God who is merciful. He has mercy on those who have transgressed against him. He did not just sweep their sins under the rug. He had to come down and make reconciliation for those sins. He had to become or be made what I am in order to reconcile me to God. God reconciled me to himself. That is a merciful God. One more, Psalm 40, 10 and 11. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. So what do we see in these two verses? <coughs> <clears throat> a God who is righteous. There is not one thing that God does that is not righteous. He can do nothing but righteousness. Faithful. He is faithful, faithful and will do all he says he will do. He is righteous and cannot lie. So he is faithful to his word. He says he will never forsake his people and he will always uphold them. This God is a loving and kind God. He loves his people and takes care of them. He hears them when they cry out to him. <clears throat> Just as you would do when a child of yours or a grandchild of yours cries out for help. This is what God does for his people. He is always kind to us and loving to us. In fact, we have already read the love wherewith he hath loved us. He was made a curse and sin for us. So we've just read some things in Scripture about who God is. So is God a vengeful, a consuming fire who will not at all acquit, acquit the guilty? Or is he a merciful, gracious God who sheds forth his loving kindness towards a people? Yes, he is both. The fact is most people know him as, does not, most people don't know him as either one of these. They, in fact, do not know him at all. They do not want to know this one. Knowing that God is vengeful, God who will repay, and that he who is creator of all things can cast both my body and soul into hell, causes me to reverence and fear him. Not knowing this, I will not fear and tremble before him, and I will be filled with pride as I was before God visited me. But we also know him as a loving and gracious God who has done everything that is needed to save their soul. Coming from this God who is a consuming fire and it is he who upholds them forever. This causes them to love him because he first loved them. So now with this in mind, I want to read 1 Samuel 2 verses 1 through 10 and go through what is called Hannah's Prayer. And I think it was Walter who I heard say this, but this prayer being her second prayer. 
This is one who has been brought to know who God is and gives praise, honor, and glory to him, as we will see. Others not knowing of this God, because if they did, they would turn from their own way and bow down and worship and praise, honor, and glorify him for what he has done. So let's read it. <clears throat> and Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none besides thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor, and maketh rich. He bringeth low, and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the wor world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. <coughs> This prayer is full of the gospel. I think of my prayers when I read this passage, and it just seems like my prayers are so full of self. Yeah. Hannah here in this prayer never asked anything of God. Now, she did in her first prayer. She asked for the, you know, a child, and we know Samuel came forth from that. He gave her her petition to have a child. <clears throat> But this prayer here is giving all praise, honor, and glory to him because this is where it belongs. When God moves on an individual in love, what is the first, one of the first things that happens? They rejoice. That is, they jump for joy. Knowing what has been done for them, they jump for joy. But this rejoicing is directed to one place, the Lord. The one who has been visited by God begins to boast in Jesus Christ. It says here, my horn is exalted in the Lord. The Lord is where I find my strength. I can boast in nothing any higher than Jesus Christ. He is the preeminent one and he is my only source of strength. With him there is no one who will ever over, overtake me. But she does not stop there. She says her mouth is enlarged over her enemies, and it is because of this one reason, because of his salvation. I dare not boast in myself when it comes to the enemies of God. In this flesh dwelleth no good thing, and in fact this flesh is an enemy to him, and so it is my enemy. No, I boast in his work, that is, his work of salvation, because he has done all the work. <clears throat> Notice that even here, this is said in the past tense by Hannah. Even those back then knew that God was faithful to perform that which he promised. He promised the Messiah would come, and those back then knew this. And God himself, to, to them back then, they looked forward to that day when Christ would come and save his people from their sins. Next we read, the Lord is holy. There is none like him. The Lord is holy, holy, holy. There's nothing to compare to him because there's none like unto him. 
God's people know this to be true, and it is a comfort to them. Knowing that he is this, because there will be none who shall overtake him. But it also says here, he is our rock. Now this word means cliff. I mean, it, could, it has several meanings that you could use it, uh, translate it as, but it means cliff. But it can also mean a rock or a boulder, or it can mean a refuge. I think of this word as it means cliff, and he is such a one that no one will get past him. They will not scale up this cliff, nor get around it. But he's also a rock, a boulder, one that cannot be moved. Who is there that will move him? He is our refuge. There is a cliff in this rock where we are held safe from the wrath of this one who will take vengeance on his enemies. What peace and safety we find there. We can cry out with the Apostle Paul in Romans 8.31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Knowing who he is and that salvation must and does come through him, it will stop our mouths from saying certain things. It will at least cause us to think about what we say and do, all by his grace. The proud words which we have all spoken at one time have now been turned to rejoicing and praise to him. God is one who knows all things. You will not have pride and arrogancy without him knowing it. Do you inquire of who God is with pride and arrogancy? Or has he brought you to that place where, like Job, you want to put your hand on your mouth to keep anything from coming out? Job 44. Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Yeah. He weighs all actions, and by the context, these actions involve what we say. God will weigh them. He, his justice will be satisfied. Are you lying on him? This is the pride of man. He makes his God like unto himself. Those of this world who do not know this sovereign God, they spout forth their idea of who their God is. The God they like is a, is a God to them because that God fits into their likes and their dislikes. What will the God spoken of here think of your words? God will deal with some in mercy and some in judgment. Those who are not sick have no need of a physician. The reason this world can erect a God like unto themselves is they see no need of God who can show mercy. They know nothing of needing mercy. The scripture is full of speaking about God being a merciful God. If he is merciful, and he is, then there has to be a reason why he would be merciful. There he is. And it is mercy towards those who have offended him. Yet men want to walk in pride and serve a God of their own imagination rather than bowing down to an absolute, holy, sovereign God. <clears throat> but we know God is not going to be thwarted. He will have his way. What did Nebuchadnezzar find out in Daniel 4.37? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his, judge, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. There are those here spoken of that are mighty, that is, mighty in their own strength, in, in uh, second, uh, 1 Samuel 2 here. They think they have a handle on God. Their might, their strength will be broken. Verse 4. Those who are weak and cannot take another step, lest he comes to them in mercy, for these he will be their strength. In verse 5, I do believe that Hannah thought back to when uh, Penina uh, provoked or troubled her because she was barren. But I do agree with Robert Hawker that this means much more than just that instance. The scripture says, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Those who are not hungry for a God righteousness think they have their own righteousness. They will be, will be found wanting. 
<clears throat> but this also reminds me of, of the passage in Romans, Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So God, through his work of salvation, will take those who are just like everyone else born in Adam, meaning they have a sinful fallen nature which hates God just like everyone else. But he brings them to this place where they have no other hope but him, and this by his faith given to them, and God counts that to them for righteousness, calling me righteous, although I have so much unrighteousness in me. So now we come to the verse or verses which I really wanted to get to in my message today. What do we read in verse 6? And I think it's important for us to note in what order this is said. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. Certainly God Almighty has the right and power to kill who he wants. And he can make those who are dead alive again. But I believe this is talking about that time just as Paul spoke of when he said, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. That's Romans 7, 9. God sends his people his law, and it condemns them to death. They die. God kills them. This is where God's schoolmaster takes those who are his. This law takes men and women down to the grave where all hope is lost. Should there be none who would have come to help, they would, they would all be lost. But we also read here, and maketh alive. He does both of these things to those whom he loves. He first brings his people into the grave, but then lifts them up out of the grave. This he does by giving them faith I just spoke about. He sends them his gospel by the faith given them. Then they believe the record God gave of his son, and they are alive unto God in him. What does it say next? He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Just notice how it says this. It is as if he is doing both of these things. <clears throat> I know he has the ability to do these things, but when you read it, this, you get the sense that he is actually doing both of these things to individuals. This is certainly what he does to us, but he also did this to his son for us. He brought him down to the grave for us, and he bringeth him up again to sit on his throne, saving us to the uttermost, it says in Hebrews. But as it concerns us, and several men have said, if you have never been lost, you will never be found. God makes those who are his to become lost and without hope in their mind before he shows them that life is in him, and in him is where I must be found. We have this same type of things, thing in the next verse. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He will bring you to that place where God shows you by his schoolmaster that you have no righteousness of your own. He shows us that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. But then he fills us with the righteousness of his dear son. He wraps that robe around us as he ushers us back home as the prodigal sons. Poor beggars clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, making his people rich in him. Notice in all these, these things who is doing all of this. It says he, he, he. God Almighty does all of this. In fact, he must do all of this or else it will not be done. But what do we read in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30? But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I have the riches of his grace bestowed on me in Christ. The prayer goes on. Those poor whose home is in the dust, whose house is the dung pile. He lifts us, those up off of this place and he places them where they will be filled continually, never to have a care again. They will, this says, inherit the throne of glory. 
Why? Because it is all his and he can do with what, what is his, what he wants. He being the head and we being the body, he tells us we will reign on his throne with him in Christ. It goes on to say he will keep the feet of his saints. How does he do this? He gives them light to see on the way. This he does through his gospel, sending it to them when he is pleased and as often as he is pleased. He will direct their steps by his spirit when the gospel is heard. They glorify God in his son. No man will by strength, it says, prevail. Man does not have the power to become mightier than God. Man, in fact, has no might of his own. Where do we find our might? His gospel, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We wield his word, that sword of the spirit, and I'm not saying that we preach the Spirit into men and women. I'm not saying that at all. But His Spirit uses that word to divide asunder both soul and spirit. God will make you miserable so that you have nowhere to run. Just when you think all hope is lost, His gospel shows you Christ and Him crucified, and you begin to rejoice. Just as Hannah did here. The last verse, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. The Lord is who it says here. This is talking about Jesus Christ. It will be him, that little baby Jesus, meek and mild, as the world says. It will be this one who will thunder down judgment on his enemies. I know this is talking about Jesus Christ because it says, last of all here it says, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ of God. This is who God is and this is the God that Hannah prayed to. I hope this is the God that all those who hear this message pray to. I hope it is the one they know. If this is not the God you know, I pray he put you in that place where you have no, no other place to turn. But to this one and true holy God, if everything is going good for you, if everything is falling into place, you might have some concern as to something not being right. God's people must go through tribulations. They will experience trials. They will at times suffer persecu persecution. But what they do is they rejoice. They rejoice in the God who is an absolute sovereign control, who has the right and who has the might to avenge his people. He has promised that he would, so I don't even have to worry about that. Scripture tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the, mo the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We need things in this life to live, and our God has promised to take care of his people. We are told not to take thought for these things. I know this is a hard thing because we have this flesh and it hates God with everything it can. But our Lord tells us not to even take thought of those things. We are to seek first the kingdom of God. Where are we going to see the kingdom of God? The gospel. Where are we going to see who is the king of the kingdom? The gospel. I need saving every day and God has told us that it pleases him by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Does the gospel mean anything to you? To you? If you want to know who God is, that's where you'll find out who he is, by the power of his spirit. God is who he says he is in his word. He is a consuming fire, but this is a comfort to his people because we know he will protect us from all things. 
But he is also a merciful God who has forgiven the sins of his people through his son. Here is a cry of a believer. Proverbs 38 and 9. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name, name of my God in vain. Cause me to always to look to you, my rock and my salvation. Keep pride from me, lest I believe I have strength on my own. Does your God look like the God of this word? I pray that that is so. Amen.